Sheol, Hades, and Gehenna. All three are words that we've been looking at uh, over the past few days. All three of these words have been translated as hell in some of our English translations. Now today we're going to come to a fourth word, our final word. It's one that the Apostle Peter used in his second letter in the New Testament. This word is very different than the other three, yet at the same time it has something in common. And that is, it has nothing to do with the lake of fire. And also, just like the other three words, this is one that for most of my life as a Christian, and even as a pastor, I never thought to look up, or look into, or study. Like so many, I assumed that all the words translated as hell meant the same thing, which in my mind, man, it was the pictures painted by Dante in his Inferno in the 1300s. What a shock it was to discover that I was wrong. Now, I'm no stranger to wrongness. What about you? That's why we study. That's why we seek to do what Paul told Timothy to do, to be diligent, to dig in, to seek to rightly divide the word of truth, to be like the Bereans, to search the scriptures, to see if the things we've been taught are true, to also not be like the Pharisees who Jesus rebuked for teaching doctrines which were in reality the commandments and traditions of men. Do you think the same thing still happens today? In 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, the Apostle Peter is talking about destructive doctrines, teachers who deny the Lord. They deny, apparently, what Christ accomplished, maybe limited what he, he did on the cross, or belittling what he did on the cross, making what he did insufficient. To me, that would be a denial of the Lord. Wouldn't you think so? He says that many people will follow their ways. And then he says because of their covetousness. In other words, these teachers coveting what others have, wanting what others have, because of their covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. In other words, they're going to covet what people have and preach messages geared at, well, apparently taking what's yours and making it theirs. Messages geared at your bank account, your wallet, your, your purse. Probably never heard anything like that before, have you? Peter says eventually they're going to have to answer to God for it and they will be judged. Peter then goes on, and he shares some examples of people and angels who have experienced the wrath of God who or who will experience the judgment of God. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, this is also where we find our fourth and final word translated as hell in some of the English translations of the Bible. Let me read this verse for you. I'll read it today from the New King James. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. You may want to jot that verse down. It says this, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And then we come to the end of the verse. And he goes on. He gives some examples of humans who experience uh, the wrath of God. He talks about those who died in the flood of Noah's day, those who died in the fire in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, in future studies, we'll see that those same people will one day be resurrected to stand before God as well. But right now, let's just look at verse 4. I want us to key in on one particular word, and that's the word hell. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Okay. This is talking about, first of all, a group of angelic beings. They've been cast down to, it says here in the New King James, into hell, and they are chained up in darkness, and they are waiting for judgment. Angels in chains, in the dark, waiting to eventually be judged. Now, the word translated as hell in this verse is kind of hard to pronounce. It's tartarao. Tartarao. It's a form of the word tartarus, and, or not tartar sauce, by the way. Tartaros or tartarao. You can tell English is my native tongue. I can't speak Greek worth beans. But this is the only place this word word is used in the Bible, just this one verse. And obviously, if you've been with us uh, looking at the other words translated as hell, you realize right away that this one is very distinctly different. If you haven't listened to our previous five or six teachings on this topic of hell, I encourage you to do so. But here we find this word, tartarao, a form of tartaros or tartaros or tartar sauce, however you want to say it. But as we look at these words and their meanings, it becomes very, very eye-opening. 
maybe even life-changing or perspective-altering uh, as we look at our Heavenly Father and His plans for humanity. Now, for most of my life, even as a pastor, I had never bothered to do a word study on these words uh, because it just seemed too obvious. There are certain doctrines in our, our lives, things that have been in our traditions for so long, they became like a, a sacred cow. You, you bow before it and you never think to, to question it. Uh, when I finally did start looking at these words, I was shocked. Now, hell is just one of, of many topics I'd never thought to look at. And uh, as I've spoken with other people and even with uh, pastoral peers, most of them have never really looked into it either. They just look at the accepted commentaries uh, from their denomination. Right? If we do happen to study something on our own and we see something that is not in line with our traditions, uh, as people, as you know, when I was a pastor, as someone who, whose livelihood depended upon uh, being accepted in a particular group, you became afraid to even question those traditions. And in most religious circles and denominations, even non denominational networks of churches or even independent local congregations with a board that a pastor is, uh, has to answer to, there are certain topics that you aren't allowed to question or you'll lose your job and be out on your ear. So sadly, even if a pastor were to have a different viewpoint, uh, most of the time they're afraid to express it or even to ask for a second opinion because if you even bring it up, you're probably going to get in, in trouble. There's a passage with, that, that tells us that uh, people are going to have itching ears and they're going to heap up for themselves teachers who will tell them what they want to hear and, and, and tickle their ears. And typically, guys... Folks will judge whether a doctrine is true or false, not based upon honest and diligent study, but instead based upon what they already believe, based upon what they heard first, whatever their tradition is. And if a pastor comes along and, and preaches what people already believe, which is why they hire pastors, by the way, is to tell them what they want to hear, they go, this guy is solid and biblical. He's telling us what we already believe. He's not challenging our traditions. This is a good guy. How about we give him a raise? Now, if he challenges the people, the guy is a heretic. But anyway, all of that is beside the point. Let me get back on track. Tartarao. This is the only place it's used, and it's not speaking of a place of ultimate judgment or a place of wrath. We know that because of what the verse says. It's speaking of a holding tank where these fallen angels, these demonic beings, are in chains waiting for the time when they will be judged. They're not being judged now. They're not being tortured. They are simply in waiting. Yet, it was translated as hell. Now, in contrast, in the following verses, it says something different about the people who will one day be judged. They are dead. They were killed either by water or fire. They're not in chains waiting to be judged. So anyway, this place is not described as a place where people go. It's a specific place where certain demonic beings are being held as they wait to be judged. That's it. That's what the verse tells us about this word, and this is the only place this word is used. So once more, with our fourth and final word translated as hell, we find that it doesn't really resemble the pictures that come to our minds when we hear the word hell. And once again, we see that each of these four words basically means something different, except for Sheol and Hades. They kind of mean the same thing. Hades is a Greek form of Sheol, and so they speak of the same thing. Uh, for reference, on my website, you can listen to a message that was called, I believe, Sheol, an Inferno, or a Grave. I did that one about a week ago. Um, let me touch real quick on something, though. These demonic beings, again, they are in chains, being reserved for judgment. For judgment. What comes into your mind when you think of judgment, being judged by God? What's it mean? What is the judgment of God about? What's it going to mean for those demonic beings. What's the future judgment hold for me and you, those people that died in the flood? What's it mean for those who were destroyed in Sodom and Gomorrah? Listen, I believe future judgment is going to happen. It's clearly there on the pages of Scripture. Some of you who have been listening to my previous studies are thinking, ah, oh, James believes there's no such thing as judgment. Oh, there is. I also believe God takes sin very seriously, which is why Jesus died on the cross such a horrible death for our sin. I also believe that there is a lake of fire. And it's something distinctly different than all four of these words we've looked at that have been translated as hell. And I believe people are going to be cast into it and the devil will be cast into it. But as we think about judgment and fire and the purposes of God and the nature of God and what Christ came to do upon the cross and through his resurrection and passages like 
where Paul talked about people being saved as though through fire. I don't know about you, but I've got questions. And in our next study, we're going to look at judgment and punishment and the words in the Bible that refer to God judging and punishing humanity. We're going to see what these words mean. And we're going to consider what the purpose of God is in judging and and punishing. And it may or may not be what you've always thought it is. My name is James Flanders, and I'm learning to walk the path of grace. And I'm so glad that you're with me as we learn more about our Creator, the one true living God who the Bible describes as a consuming fire. And at the same time, it calls him love. Could the loving fire of God be for the good of those cast into it? Hmm, that's something to meditate on. And that's what we'll talk about next time. Be blessed, my friend. Be blessed.